And then as soon as we have a clear way forward, once the SIU report is, is finalized, then we'll be able to um, expedite the way forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Chair and members, for the opportunity. That concludes our presentation. All right, no, thank you very much. Um, uh, okay, um, let's go to DPSA um, <clears throat> on, on that. I just feel like what has been said could have been sent in a letter. Okay, DPSA. Thank you, Chair. I, I'm now scared because probably even what I'm going to say could have been said in a letter. <laughs> we really don't have much to say as DPSA, but we had to comply with the request of um, the committee to appear in respect to this matter. Just a recap from our side, the, we appeared in the committee on, uh, to the committee in, on 13 September, I think with the colleagues as well from Treasury and SIU, and we did highlight that in the 21-22 financial year, we were removed from IFMS by the MPSA at the time and we were brought back in the 22-23 financial year by the acting MPSA. We had not signed the MOU at the time as there were areas we were still engaging on, including the request we had made for dedicated project management capacity as the IFMS um, uh, rollout requires uh, that capability and um, the coordination and financing of the IFMS is centralized to uh, National Treasury currently. We've, uh, we have not yet signed the MOU because I think it's been overtaken by other engagements that the DG has, has reflected on. But we've, we've had ongoing engagements with National Treasury, both at the ministerial level and at our level as officials. Some of the uh, challenges, IFMS challenges, uh, I, I wish to highlight um, uh, briefly is that um, this project is intended to be the cornerstone of digital transformation in the public service. And despite extensive efforts since in its inception, there's been significant delays that have been encountered and challenges persist in operationalizing the system. The investigations and uh, in brackets, uh, SIU, I think there's also been a public protector SA investigation and maybe other investigations into the procurement process have also contributed to the delays and it is not yet clear what the impact of the outcomes will that be on the, on the IFMS itself. And the moratorium on the acquisition of the IT systems, which was issued by Treasury uh, in 2016, um, uh, all those systems within the scope of IFMS, which would mainly affect your HR module-related uh, systems. Um, um, so we had a moratorium since 2016. And the majority of requests for deviations received by, by Treasury, 59%, had to do with the HRM functions. This just shows the need in the public service and that departments are ready to roll out and implement, but we've had um, uh, the moratorium which has made it impossible. Um, then in terms of the need for digital transformation, uh, IFMS challenges have had a significant Im impact on the public service and its ability to seize opportunities to digitize and automate administrative processes. For instance, Chair, we get a lot of questions from Parliament about uh, public servants doing business with the state, public servants facing disciplinary action, all kinds of information that if we had a, a system a, a, dig, a, a digital system that has capability, an HRM system that has capability, we would at the press of the button be able to get that information. But now, just on a simple thing as qualifications, 
we rely on the use of a remuneration system, which is PESAL, which is really an old legacy system that has its own challenges. And we rely on it to be able to get information. And some departments do not update information. And you can't really force them beyond just sending circulars and begging people to be able to do that. Um, so uh, the importance of modernizing and digitizing HRM functions is, emphas is emphasized by the adoption of the National Framework for Professionalization. Our public sector reforms are not going to be implementable if we are continuously subjected to the delays that we have experienced and we cannot automate and digitize uh, the HRM functions in the public service. So for us, digital transformation holds the key to unlocking greater efficiency and effectiveness in the public service and addressing the evolving demands of governance and administration. In terms of the way forward, uh, the DPSA is the police owner for HRM in the public service must lead the public service in the implementation of an integrated HRM system so that the delays and, and uncertainty on IFMS do not critically impact on DPSA's ability to deliver on its mandate. This should be guided by a digital transformation strategy and plan for the public service. For us, an e-recruitment module for the public service is a priority. And uh, for our department, but also for the public service, we, we should all be on the same platform by now, just on e-recruitment. And it can be implemented independently and integrated later. We've had engagements with CETA that presented to us a system that they have that can be deployed immediately, but they were charging us an arm and a leg, and we didn't have the money to pay for it. So we, we abandoned that process, but CETA did indicate they were willing to engage because the system is already developed and it's available. DPSA requires dedicated human resources and financial resources for us to be able to run a program of this nature. My last slide, just looking at concluding remarks, Chair, uh, um, we, uh, we just want to highlight again that the integrated human resource management concept document for the minister's approval has been developed and we will be submitting it before the end of this financial year, which means between today and tomorrow we're sending a formal submission to the minister and deputy minister. And once approved, uh, it will then be submitted to the minister of finance. Um, an integrated HR system business case. Work has been started, but we, we stuck with some technical issues and we are hoping to engage CETA to also provide some support to us from a technical capability and even the IFMS team from Treasury. Cabinet memo seeking approval for the integrated HRM project to be um, uh, separated from the IFMS processes which are affected by the delays of the investigations and other things. Um, we have to send this memo to cabinet once the ministers sign off because uh, it's important that the, the, the IFMS project was a decision of cabinet and the involvement of DPSA in the project as it is structured was a decision of cabinet. So we have to go back to cabinet in relation to that. And of course, uh, the broader work that is being done around developing a new strategy and implementation plan for this project, linking it to the human capital strategy work that's looking at public sector reforms in terms of HR that we have concluded in the current financial year is very important. Two main critical success factors for us is that um, the engagements we're having with Treasury must also look at impact and the budget allocations because we can't operate from zero in terms of being able to do this work. And um, also we need to uh, prioritize uh, the appointment of dedicated resources who are able to drive and coordinate this integrated HRM project to get, together with key stakeholders. As matters stand, we are living on budget cuts, so we, we, do, we can't even shift and prioritize resources internally. I think we've done reprioritize, sufficient reprioritization in, internally that we are left as being bones with no meat currently. Um, so that's all from our part, Chair. Thank you very much. All right. No, thank you very much. Um, you know why I was saying this should have been sent in a letter? Because the postponement gave the impression that you would arrive here with a mega package and roadmap. Now it says we're waiting for 
the finalization of the SIU. And I'm like, she could have simply asked for another postponement. I'm just not sure whether we're landing on the right runway. Because I may, I may ask the question, was this the status of matters three weeks ago when we postponed? So I just hope, DM, you can reflect on that whilst we go to the SIU uh, investigation uh, report. But I, I just, consultations are gonna be done and we're going to conclude on the matter. Conclusion is not there. Abum Tip, can I hand over to you and your team, please? Now, thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, DMs present in the meeting, DGs, uh, my colleagues. Uh, we really are appreciative of the opportunity to come and update uh, the Honorable Committee on the process uh, since the last time we appeared. Um, so, Honorable Chair, uh, it's not so many slides, but we thought we thought we could probably um, rehash what we what we uh, presented uh, the last time, uh, just so that it's clear uh, where the investigation is at the moment and where and where we are. <clears throat> um, and and we will, of course, in the in the in the presentation also touch on what. Uh, DG of uh, National Treasury indicated that since the last time, uh, as, as part of the investigative process, uh, we, we, did, we did interact with uh, National Treasury uh, where they indicated that they wanted to make representations. Uh, representation really just in the form of saying uh, this is further uh, information that we have, which uh, we are of the view that you need to take into account as you investigate, and it may then uh, lead to probably a different finding than the one that we presented at Scopa at the last time. Uh, we, will, we will also deal with that. Um, I'm going to uh, allow my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Lecheto, who is leading the investigation, to really start on slide number six, uh, 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 to, to then take the committee through, and then I will, I will come back uh, as we then deal with the actual findings and uh, really the issues around investigations versus you know, what happens on the operations side. Thank you. Mr. Lechetu, if you can proceed, please. Thank you, Advocate. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Member, Deputy Minister, DG, and all the colleagues present in the meeting. Uh, the presentation is just to give an update since the last meeting we met, and we didn't really go into details pertaining to the issue that we presented last time. Then, based on the slides, it just indicates that we receive a proclamation uh, R4 of 2020, which was also amended by R40 of 2020. And the main issue about the proclamation to investigate uh, the procurement of contracting for integrated financial management system by or on behalf of the National Treasury and the payments made in respect thereof. And the proclamation was amended by way of a proclamation R40. Next slide, just give the background to the investigation, which is uh, when we start with time one commercial of the shelf enterprise resource planning solution. The SIU received a whistleblower report alleging corruption and irregularities in the procurement process for the integrated financial management system, 
which was awarded to Oracle SAPTY LTD, that is Oracle. It was alleged that procurement process and the award for the entire one commercial off the shelf enterprise resource planning solution was irregular. There was malperformance and or no performance by the service provider and professional consultant or any other person or entity. And also that there was no value for money received by National Treasury and there was a cor corrupt senior official at National Treasury was involved in the award of the current contract to Oracle. A hybrid architect was approved for the IFMS project after cabinet memorandum 16 of, 20, of 2005 was issued with the subject integrated financial management system project. However, after the issue of cabinet memorandum 35 of 2013, the solution was changed from a hybrid architect to a cost ERP. And on the 5th of November 2013, the cabinet amended the procurement of the COTS ERP. And on the 29th of January 2014, the IFMS steering committee approved that the procurement of the COTS ERP solution was to be done through CETA. The focus area of the investigation was to investigate the procurement of and contracting for the IFMS by or on behalf of National Treasury and payments made in respect thereof, and also was to determine whether a proper procurement process was followed, also to verify the mal performance and or non-performance by Oracle or any other person or entity, and also to de determine if value for money was received by National Treasury and losses in care and also to conduct a corruption investigation, which is to include the profiling and lifestyle audit of officials and service providers. And in terms of the objective of the investigation, it was to review compliance with the prescribed legislation, policy, procedure, directive, and other relevant applicable prescript in respect of the procurement of goods and services by the state institution, and also to identify irregular and lawful conduct on the part of the official or employee of the state or any other person, and also to collect lawful admissible evidence to institute civil proceeding, also to set aside contract awarded by the state institution if appropriate, and also to recover public money that was not due owing or payable in respect of the procurement process was, that was followed by the state institution. And largely was to prevent further losses to the state and also to refer such evidence for the institution of appropriate disciplinary, administrative, executive, and criminal proceeding against complicit parties. And lastly, was to provide recommendation on improvement of systemic weaknesses that will have been identified. And in terms of high-level finding, the SIU has identified the following that irregular SEM process were followed and there was non-compliance with SEM policy and legislation and there was conflict of interest which was identified and also we have identified fruitless and wasteful expenditure. In terms of the current status, after the SIU's presentation to SCOPA on the 13th of September 2024, National Treasury requested that they be given an opportunity to make representation in respect of the SIU findings. And the SIU agreed and National Treasury submitted their representation on the 22nd of January 2024. The SIU has had an opportunity to review National Treasury's uh, representation and the accompanying documentation which were considered against the SIU findings. The documents provided by National Treasury were in fact instrumental in the SIU investigation and were considered when making our initial findings. After a thorough review and evaluation process of the representation, the SIU advised National Treasury on the 22nd of March 2024 that it still hold the same position and therefore the SIU finding will still stand that the contract was awarded irregular. Then in terms of the outcome of the investigation, as we have indicated previously, 
we have referred two disciplinary referrals to National Treasury, and we have issued one blacklisting referral letter to National Treasury. Five criminal matters have been referred to the National Prosecuting Authority. And in terms of the civil, senior counsel has been appointed and was briefed by the SIE on the 2nd and 3rd and, and 6th of February 2024, respectively, to assist the SIU in reviewing the available evidence as pertained to the Oracle contract. And systemic recommendations have been identified and are included in the presidential report. Therefore, the, pres the presidential report has been compiled but had been put on hold initially, which was awaiting the review of national treasury representation. The SIU now will proceed to finalize the report. So that's all from the SIU. Thank you. No, thank you, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, uh, Honorable Members and TMs. Uh, so essentially, the status is that the investigation is complete. That's, that's where we are. Uh, uh, and it's been completed, uh, concluded with the findings that we have presented. Um, uh, of course, during the investigation, we've gathered you know, uh, evidence, which, of course, we really can't unpack uh, in, the, in, the, in the committee meeting, but we do have the evidence that supports the findings. Um, as, as the presentation says, <clears throat> On the 13th, we were requested that, uh, amongst others, uh, National Treasury wanted to make representations. It's a process that's allowed in, in, in investigations before we finalize you know, our, our findings and report. We made that possible. And as we indicate, uh, in a sense, those, that, that evidence wasn't materially new to the investigators. Uh, and, and when we took it into account, we realized that they actually was the evidence that we took into account before we made the findings. And we've reached now the outcomes that have been presented. Uh, <clears throat> now, with regard to the execution, the execution of the outcomes, right. Um, so, so, we, so we have found that the, um, the, the contract is, is, is irregular. Um, can you please go back to the, uh, yeah, no, no. Slide 14, uh, is it this one? 16, I think it is, 16, on the outcomes. Yeah, there we go. Uh, if I can spend just a few minutes on this, uh, and it's also supported by uh, slide number five in terms of how we do our business. <clears throat> now, the, the disciplinary referrals that have been referred would have been on the basis of the evidence that we uncovered that indicated the roles of officials in the National Treasury that they would have played in the process of these uh, irregularities. And, uh, and those referrals would have been issued. Uh, so the blacklisting part is against the service provider uh, based on the, of course, the findings that we have made. And of course, we expect that that process should also unfold. Uh, and then the five criminal matters that have been referred to the NPA by law when we find that there's evidence pointing to criminal action, uh, whether it's a criminal offense envisaged in the PFMA or any other uh, legislation, we are required to refer that to NPA. And NPA will progress that, will process that with our collaboration and, if necessary, collaboration with the, with the SAPS, in particular the Hawks, in many instances. Right, and then number, bullet point number four. Uh, as we indicate there, we have appointed uh, counsel, of course, the, the, our civil litigation division uh, will now. So what has happened is that we, the investigators gathered evidence that indicated that, you know, the SCM process was irregular, there were irregularities. So what happens is they then uh, hand it over to the civil litigation team, uh, particularly relating to the contract uh, at hand. Now, the civil litigation team will proceed now uh, uh, to now uh, really institute civil proceedings. And those civil proceedings are with the intent of cancelling this contract uh, and recovery uh, where appropriate, depending on what uh, 
the extent of the loss, stroke damage that, we, that evidence would have indicated. So the, the civil proceedings will be instituted in the special tribunal. Uh, and, and that process, now that uh, we've concluded now, listen to the representations, we are now proceeding with the, with, with the civil uh, proceedings uh, as, as envisaged. The systemic recommendations, of course, uh, as part of our investigations, where there are weaknesses in the administration system, we continually raise them. Um, and <clears throat> I think it's also important to note that all of the above, the execution of the outcomes do not wait for the president's report. Uh, because it's, it's essential that we execute on the consequence management, um, uh, legally, legal findings are there. We have made findings that are supported by evidence, at least as far as we are concerned. Now, based on those findings, we are able to execute. Right? And that's why the disciplinary processes can proceed as we expect, civil proceedings, uh, civ uh, criminal referrals. Now, uh, because we said as a result of uh, the representations, we put the process of you know, uh, finalizing the report on hold, we will now proceed and now compile the President's report. In a sense, in that, that report will, amongst others, you know, indicate that these, were the out these are the findings, these are the outcomes, and this is where we are in executing the findings. So, so, so they're really not delayed. I think it's very important to note that. Uh, that the, the speed of action, at least after finalizing, it's important. Um, chair, oh, the, the, one, the one part, uh, I think the issue around, you know, whether when we presented last time, we presented the draft report or not. Look, uh, <clears throat> as, as, as we continually present, you know, in, in, in SCOP or other parliamentary committees, is that uh, <clears throat> we would essentially be presenting the status of the investigation. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we really wanted to, uh, I mean, you could really treat it as a report or progress report, but it wasn't a draft presidential report, just to put it on record. It was not a draft presidential report that we presented here on the 13th. It was a status report of the investigation and where we are, and now we will now proceed finalize uh, the, 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 the report to the president. Thank you. All right. The more things change, the more they stay the same. All right. Uh, we're gonna go to uh, questions, um, and then you will just indicate colleagues where you are directing them to. Uh, and then we will get those responses. Mazamban, Babuli, Umani, Babusom. Okay, well, that sequence. <coughs> Mazamban, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you to everyone for the reports. I, I'm afraid I, I, I am somewhat with you in, in the view that we, we haven't really made any progress. There's been some talking and so on. And the IFMS system. Is, is a critical system. It's been in the making, I think, for nearly 20 years. Um, and, and I think it's, it's so critical that it's hampering um, the, the whole country in its, in its ability to function properly. So it is disappointing. And, and so when, when I listen to the SIE report, I mean, it's, it's kind of done, but there's no next step in terms of of the system. I mean, the next steps in terms of holding people accountable, and absolutely that must happen. But in terms of the system, I I'm at a loss as to what the next step is there um, and getting that going. Although I'm not being entirely correct there because um, Duncan has indicated that there, there's, there's uh, agreement about the DPA, DPSA system um, on, on, on employees, or whatever it's called, uh, moving ahead. So there, I'm wrong, there is some, some movement, but the big picture, uh, I'm a bit lost. So I'd like to have some indication probably from you, Duncan, as to where does it go from here? You know what the, the SIE report is, is saying. Um, presumably you've, you've thought about this and, uh, 
and what is the next step in terms of the, the, the whole system, the big system. Um, then to, to, to you, Andy, in terms of the outcomes, um, the, who are the, dis the disciplinary referrals? Who are the people involved? I assume that the blacklisting is Oracle. Is that blacklisting then based on malfeasance on the part of Oracle as opposed to the failure of following the correct procedures in terms of, of National Treasury's role in the system? Has Oracle been um, naughty here? Um, because then uh, presumably they may be part of the five criminal matters you mention. Um, so, uh, you know, who are the, or what are the entities or people involved in the five criminal matters referred to the NPA? Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me stop there. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome all the presentations and all. Um, uh, just to follow on the questions that have already been asked, maybe I should start with the uh, National Treasury and just check with these contracts that you do with IFMS or similar. Do you, you know, one of the biggest problems that I've found with these uh, service providers is things that are called out of scope and all of that, that you find that government departments tend to sign contracts and you have to pay all kinds of monthly premiums. But every time you want a particular uh, execution to be done, then you are told that's out of scope. So you then end up with costs that are running wild because everything is just out of scope. So I wanted to just check with IFMS project or similar. As National Treasury, have you got uh, systems in place to ensure that there is maybe very little or nothing in terms of so-called out of scope? Because I just find that it is one way to rip off government, that uh, you just lay the basic infrastructure and everything, and everything else is out of scope. So you actually pay double uh, uh, after, after all is said and done. That's the first question. But also, I wanted to just understand now that uh, with what we know now with the processes, I'm just struggling, a chair, to understand why is this thing not moving. Uh, I mean, if I listen to, to DPSA, DPSA seems to be almost like uh, it's a life support system that this uh, thing must provide. But SIU is saying depending on how the processes work in their referrals and everything, there's a chance this thing might just be uh, declared unlawful and, 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 and stopped. I just don't know where that leaves us 20 years later. Uh, can we just give some comfort? Why at the same time we know that uh, we need to have a digitized government system, we need to have e-everything, but what SIU is saying uh, makes me nervous to say, where will this leave us? I mean, it's like uh, we're in limbo to no end. Um, and then on the, on the SIU, what I wanted to just check, I don't know whether it's covered in some of the documents that I haven't seen. Last time when we were here, my biggest issue was Fort Hay. Uh, if there's that that proclamation. I was looking for the date in which you amended that proclamation and the date in which you handed uh, to Mr. Ramaphosa to sign, because I'm not finding that uh, there is seriousness in holding executive accountable. Uh, just to remind you, you know that you've got that fake master's degree uh, in the Eastern Cape by that premier there. So, <clears throat> and he, he relied on a loophole to avoid being dealt with. And I know that you've amended the, uh, the, the thing, but I just don't have the days. If you could please uh, indicate, because I want to see what, what is it that uh, is stopping uh, that, <coughs> that proclamation from being uh, signed off, uh, as it were. And then on the outcomes, I think uh, I would have had the same question on, on, on the affected individuals. I think by now, I don't know if processes allow that 
I mean, if uh, Mazamba here already knows the company's Oracle, uh, the individuals, is it, are you at liberty to tell us who are these people uh, that uh, have been referred for disciplinary and all of that? And then the other companies that were also part of the investigation, have you given now them a clean bill of health? I just want to know this because uh, some of these companies, they talk to us, they say, uh, because, you know, because uh, one of the biggest issues that uh, happens in the private sector is that once SIU is on your tail, nobody wants to deal with you as a company. Uh, and then you find that SIU is maybe still talking to you, a person of interest and all of that, but it's almost like you taint people by tagging them as people of interest. Uh, and I've got no problem with people of interest that you finally nail or not nail, whatever. But to keep a, pers a person under some dark cloud as a person of interest, but you don't pronounce on this person, you're actually killing p business people out there. So I just want to know that can you today say that uh, you've got, now that this thing is done, can we then say that uh, all other companies that were persons of interest or whatever, can you give them a I'm not advocating for left or right, but I'm advocating for certainty. Tell them you are in the dock, tell them you are not out of, you are out of the dock, whatever. But I just, just don't think it's fair for companies to be under investigation permanently. Now you've pronounced definitively to say the report is done. Can you give us an assurance that all companies that were under the cloud will either be in the black box or in the white box? so that there's, uh, there's certainty. Lastly, do you have some uh, indication on this final report that you say now you're going to submit and all of that? What sort of timelines are we looking at? I'm in particular interested in it happening within this uh, term of office of uh, this administration so that we don't have unending problems, unnecessary handovers, uh, to the EFF government that is coming through uh, in the next term. Thank you. All right. Uh, Babu Samia. Hey, I'm a pooper. I'm a pooper. Let me, let me, let me, let me turn that, that. Those are dreams. No, no, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, thanks for the, uh, for the, for the reports. I, I chaired the, 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 the previous meeting, um, which gave rise into uh, the, the, the summary uh, uh, of actions or to be taken there. But as, I, as I'm receiving these reports, specifically on the Treasury side, they, they present a, a, a very serious scenario. That scenario, unfortunately, puts treasury as a crime scene. Because when you say you can't touch anything uh, up until this investigation has been, has been done, it's as if uh, treasury as an institution is a crime scene. So you're quarantined, you can't do anything in as far as this kind um, uh, of, a, of a project is concerned. I think that's, that's a problem which engulfed the PSA, that uh, now they opt to have an HR system which is going to be independent of these other things up until you, which is a very creative way uh, of saying, because we need this integrated HR system, uh, let's have it uh, while you are busy with your own things, uh, to clear yourselves in as far as these are elements and their findings by the, by the SIU. Uh, uh, but that kind of a scenario is as well a bit unfortunate because it is moving away from the intended objective. Uh, and it puts you as, as treasurer, well, use you, not, not necessarily yourself, but treasury, um, into a scenario which you could uh, probably provide um, uh, a situation whereby in 19 years' time, 19 years, uh, 
um, 19 years, you went to cabinet, 2005, 2005. Cabinet, here we are, I want to implement this system. Here is our plan, the project plan, approved, and then the cabinet, cabinet memo as someone runs through the mill. So in this way, you are soiling the, the, the actual intent of cabinet. So, so, so national treasury's inactivity in this good intent has been delayed such that you going to, to cabinet, 2005, 2013, and, and many other ensuing uh, uh, instances. So, so, so cabinet granting in trust that National Treasury should deal with this kind of a project. What is hanging now, is you're saying DPSA should await a, a, a cabinet's, another cabinet's approval uh, in terms of the integrated system, independent of the original system which then begins to create a trend uh, uh, which says the failure, the failure in the system, the failure uh, in terms of the outcome around here. And the inaction then poses another threat to say, not because there's SIU now and we can't do anything. And the SIU comes to us and says, here are our findings and this is final. Uh, we've moved, briefed our own uh, attorneys, uh, senior counsel, uh, and already in February. We're now sitting in March. So the intent on their part is very clear, that we've made findings, and our findings uh, in this way uh, have been uh, somewhat finalized. Yes, I agree that finding justice is, is one of the tedious routes that individuals affected or to pursue. Um, uh, you see, one way of the other speak clarity uh, on certain things. But on whose behalf are you in Treasury pursuing this food? Are you pursuing it on behalf of Treasury as an institution, which is the custodian head of a Public Finance Management Act, when there's breakage of that system, the breakage of the law, Treasury should be the first to uh, f fight that kind of breakage and uh, to be with those who want to protect uh, uh, the pursuance of uh, that path in as far as Public Finance Management Act is concerned. So, 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 so uh, uh, that's where I'm, I'm a bit dumb, uh, uh, you see, on your own activity. Then came the postponement of a meeting, like the chair says. Um, one would have expected something which says this is where we are in terms of the project. It should not be SIU Treasury uh, on the project itself in terms of its own uh, primary intention. Something which is not there. 19 years down the line from Treasury, not any other institution, not any other department, from Treasury, that's where we are. Uh, which is uh, somewhat uh, one thing that we need to have a, a fresh look uh, uh, into. Uh, if it was CETA, what would have been a situation from Treasury to CETA? If it was DPSA, what would have been the situation from Treasury to DPSA? So it, it tells us about uh, the behavioral instance uh, in as far as inward looking. Uh, of the entity, uh, the institution, at uh, Treasury. So our plea last time was that go back, deal with these kinds of things, and you're still coming back. There's no finality on your side in dealing with these kinds of things. SIU is coming back to say, we're true, we're final, uh, we're moving on, we're signing off the report, uh, there's no way back. Uh, 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 you see, so 
So we are here to ask that question. What to? Because the SIU is saying, we've listened to them, we found out that it's the same issues that we've dealt with, whatever those issues are. So we're not changing uh, our view. They informed you that they're not changing their view. But here you are saying to us, you're still pursuing with the SIU. I don't think we want to be misled by you, as you would somewhat do with other institutions. Uh, this platform must be cleared away from such uh, in the oversight uh, that we somewhat conduct. We have enlisted a number of oversight activities, which includes the, the Finance Portfolio Committee, investigations that have taken place, and in finality, the outcome uh, as referred here by the SIU. DM, you were present in the previous meeting. Leaders, where to? Thank you very much, Chair. When you say where to you, remind me of that song by Deborah Cox, where do we go from here? Honorable Hadeb, <laughs> Peter I can't sing. Same here, Chair. But I know the song uh, by Deborah Cox. Uh. <laughs> no, Chair, when I was listening to Advocate Motivi, I got very worried, scared, and frustrated. The first thing that came into my mind was press and the termination of the contract without an, uh, an alternative measures in place, which led to the current status of our rail system. Uh, that's the first thing that came into my mind. And I think the question of saying where to from here when uh, the SIU is saying there could be a possibility of um, moving to the direction of terminating the contract. And here we are, we're told this is a backbone of um, treasure in terms of integration. And if we get to that stage of finally uh, terminating without other alternative measures in place, um, I am really worried, Chair. That's my serious concern. But there are issues of clarity, um, Advocate. You have, uh, Advocate Mutibi, indicated that some of these uh, uh, referrals, your disciplinary hearings, they don't necessarily need to wait for the final report to the president. Now, this is a presidential proclamation issued by the president. What then happened in an event where, or let me differently put, is the president uh, obliged to accept all the recommendation or can he say he differs with some of the recommendation and if they are implemented, what then becomes of the status of those recommendations when they had already been implemented? I just need clarity in that aspect um, because the report, the final report, it's yet to arrive at the doorsteps of the president. Now, in an, is then, does this imply that everything that would have been implemented prior receiving a final report by the president must be agreed and, and, and supported. I, I would need clarity in, 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 in that regard, um, uh, Chair. Uh, um, that, that is my only question. I think if there are any issues of clarity, depending on the response, I, w I, will, I will then uh, make that follow up, Chair. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Um, Babum Tib, you know, I, I, I referred to slide 14. 
because I think the elephant in the room is bullet point number one. What are the implications of the SIU having identified irregular SCM process followed for this? Uh, that is uh, point number one. Secondly, to reiterate a point that colleagues have made, if National Treasury says that uh, you, you're waiting for the SIU processes, what exactly in the processes are you waiting for if the SIU says conclusively they've arrived at findings and that you have presented information which uh, they believe does not materially uh, change the outcomes. So what are you waiting for there? Which aspect or stage or level or, uh, yeah, where, where are you with it? But I think, Babu well, TV, you, 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 may, you may provide clarity for us in, in this whole situation. What are the implications of the irregular SCM process? And what recommendations are contained therein? Uh, is it termination or regularization or what? I think that will help uh, to allay uh, the collective uh, outlook that we have. Just a just, uh, follow-up, Babu Mani, and then we'll come yeah, to no, 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 thank you, Chair. So a follow-up, I just missed this to list this one question. Just as a quick uh, roundup, perhaps from National Treasury to just tell us what finally happened of the debacle around the technicalities of that uh, uh, issue around whether it's a regular expenditure and whatever. Remember, there was a, a tiff between National Treasury and the AG but the AG and the SIU were on the same side in saying this is uh, something wrong, as it were, and Treasury was saying, no, it's not, it's not wrong. They even went to court and what have you. I just don't know what finally happened uh, to that. At some point, there was some political intervention that was proposed to, I don't know what happened, what happened. Can we just get clarity as to what was the final agreed categorization of that issue? Uh, and if indeed the AG and the SIU were correct, uh, what were the consequence management of uh, uh, that uh, malfeasance? Thank you. Ms. Bobman, you actually remind me, in the 2020-2021 report, it stated that the department made a payment fee of 67.6 million rands for technical support and maintenance so software license for the IFMS, the issue of fruitless and wasteful expenditure for the IFMS annual software is under dispute. The disclosure of the fruitless and wasteful expenditure in the previous and current financial years did not necessarily mean that the National Treasury Management agreed and accepted such payment as fruitless and wasteful. So the status of that dispute is important particularly against the background now, DG, when you say that no payments have been made. So what, what, what's happening with maintenance of IFMS? Does, the, does it continue? And if or does it not? And will it not mean incurring expenditure down the line? So are we not delaying the inevitable in that at some point in the absence of clarity, or if the matter is then clarified that would have to then incur costs. So I'm just building on what to Bob Man is saying because the, 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 the AG's findings remain. But can we get responses? Uh, you will answer what's yours. Uh, we'll start with Treasury and then Babumti will come to you. DM, you'll delegate your team and then Babumti. Thanks, Chair, once more. Let me allow the DG, and then he will further delegate uh, to his team or to answer specific questions. Over to you, DG. Uh, thank you, DM. Thanks, um, uh, Honorable Chair and members for those questions. Um, let me 
start uh, with them, and then I'll ask um, the Accountant General to come in as well, uh, in particular on the issue of uh, the um, expenditure and the uh, matter with the AG. Um, so the, the, the question started with where do we go from here? Um, and part of the reason I think uh, all of us are unsatisfied with the current situation is because uh, of the following. We have a, a legally binding contract with the IFMS service provider. And that contract is legally binding until the status of that contract change, and we've got certain obligations in terms of that, that contract. Um, what we started doing last year with the accountant general was to say, um, how do we uh, renegotiate the contract um, so that we can at least take this, allow this matter to go forward, and we can ensure that we get to the goal of implementing uh, IFMS. We then made a decision following the uh, first report uh, that was received by the SIU that it's not prudent for us to continue along those lines. And we also sought legal advice in this regard. Um, because we don't want to be in a situation where we are renegotiating a contract in order to get better value for money or, or um, uh, trying to enter discussions with the supplier uh, when there's the potential that this contract uh, might be declared uh, invalid and unlawful. Uh, and that's, and that's where, we, uh, uh, where, we, where we stopped. Um, and essentially our approach has been to wait for the SIU process to be complete and then take it forward uh, from there. What's important to note, um, uh, and, and this goes to the question of the, the, um, the finality of the report, because we are waiting for that uh, in order to take the matter forward. We made submissions, representations to the SIU on the 22nd of January. We wrote to the SIU on the 25th of March and asked, um, can you please give us an update in this regard so that we know how to take this matter forward? Um, in, the, in the response by the SIU, it was indicated to them, uh, by them in writing to us, that they will not be tabling their final report, because we had sought clarity, will the SIU be tabling their final report at SCOPA? They indicated they won't be tabling their final report. What's import, what was important for us is to wait for that final report, whether it is the final report that is submitted to the president or whether it is a final report that is submitted to us. Once we have that, then we can, uh, then we can proceed and we can take advice from council on how to proceed. It's also important for us to be clear about the fact that we have um, uh, in our representation to the SIU uh, indicated, uh, and, and it wouldn't surprise any of the members here, uh, that we disagree with their findings. Uh, we disagree that um, the contract was irregularly awarded, and we take each step of the procurement process and we outline uh, why we believe that we have complied with the procurement process. So all of that detail has been provided. We disagree that there has been fruitless and wasteful expenditure, and without going into the details thereof, we explain why we disagree. Uh, and we, and we've, we've made a comprehensive uh, submission in that regard um, that, um, that runs, uh, and I'm trying to check here, that runs into uh, 75 pages or so. Um, so, uh, to, to answer the question that the, that the honorable members have asked is our approach has very much been um, as soon as we are given the uh, clearance, whether it's in the form of the submission of the report um, to the president or whether it's in the form of an indication that this matter is now, that this report is now final, uh, then we will proceed, proceed on that basis. Um, 
and, and we will then uh, take forward uh, uh, the, the process insofar as um, uh, formalizing the representations that we made uh, in, in order to demonstrate why we believe um, uh, that um, the um, allegations in, 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 in the report should be contested. Of course, that puts us in a bit of a bind because um, what does that then mean for IFMS um, uh, going forward? And what we've tried to do is to say, at the very least, let's not hold up the DPSA process, so let's allow that to go ahead. And then depending on uh, the legal advice that we receive, how do we ensure that we can still go forward with some kind of process uh, despite the fact that we are in this difficult situation where we have a legally binding contract, uh, we have representations that we want to make and that we want to further formalize based on the uh, advice that we are going to give to our uh, senior counsel, and then uh, the, the further rollout of the, of the, of the process. Um, so unfortunately, I'm, I'm not able to give a very satisfactory answer because we are stuck in this in this dilemma where um, uh, we, we, we would like to, uh, once the process is final, uh, to, take, to take the matter forward. But we also don't want to uh, go into the detail of what some of these disagreements are uh, because we would leave that to the, to the right process between ourselves um, and the SIU, but it certainly is contained in our representations. Um, I hope that that covers the questions around uh, where do we go from here, albeit in a very unsatisfactory way, and, and, and what we are waiting for uh, from, 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 from our side. Um, we, we did confirm, and, and I'll ask the Accountant General to talk to this, we did confirm that in the current financial year there's been no uh, uh, outlay against um, the maintenance and support uh, of the uh, of the contract um, it, it is on hold pending this pending this process and I'll ask um, the accountant general to come in in that regard there was a question about uh, out of scope which is broader uh, than the IFMS it's a broader government uh, issue um, um, honorable money um, we the, the the way that the procurement and the contractual system works is that um, a uh, proceeding outside of the scope of a contract uh, immediately becomes irregular, which is why as soon as a, um, uh, there is some kind of deviation from an original contract, that has to follow its own process. Um, and that has to prov be provided for in the supply chain management policy of the relevant uh, of the relevant institution, um, so the guidelines and the prescripts on this regard uh, is quite uh, quite quite clearly uh, clearly defined, precisely because of the fiscal risks that are attached uh, to that situation. Now we do know that there have been instances in the past, um, uh, certainly um, in in state-owned entities and departments where this has happened. But that is certainly something that um, uh, remains a matter that is irregular unless it is uh, resolved in terms of uh, the department or the relevant entities uh, supply chain management policy following the, the, the various prescripts. Um, I believe I've covered the other questions. If I haven't, I'm sure the honorable members will indicate. Uh, let me hand over to the Accountant General just to talk to the issue of the dispute uh, with the Accountant General and the, uh, the expenditure in this regard. Uh, thank you, uh, DG. Good morning, honorable members, honorable um, chairperson, uh, deputy ministers, colleagues. Uh, with regard to the dispute with the Auditor General, um, what members would have uh, have been n would would have known is that the Treasury has received a qualified audit report in the 21-22 financial year, and that it was in relation to what the Chair has said the maintenance and support uh, around 67 million in that financial year. There was a subsequent uh, qualif uh, qualification in the 22-23 financial year, 
And although there was no expenditure in that financial year, the qualification was in relation to the comparative number in the annual financial statement. So that qualification re related to the expenditure that occurred in the 21-22 financial year. In the last financial year, which is 23-24, there has been engagements with the Auditor General on what does this mean in terms of from an audit outcome perspective um, in, in relation to IFMS. Uh, what is clear from those engagements is that uh, the National Treasury from an audit perspective will no longer be qualified on, uh, on its accounts in relation to IFMS. The reason being is that the, 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 the actual expenditure happened uh, in preceding years and the comparative uh, number is no longer an, a, a matter that's sub subject to a dispute. So for, the, for this 23-24 financial year, uh, there is a high likelihood it will be an unqualified outcome. Um, and, and these are ongoing engagements. At the last meeting, we did indicate that whilst we look at this dispute, it's also important that uh, we do not isolate this dispute purely as an IFMS matter, but the issue of around why this matter is under contention has broader public interest considerations. Uh, we've seen in the Zondo Commission report, uh, the DG also indicated that we see that in the state there's a lot of um, risk uh, averseness by accounting officers, officials in taking decisions. And the reason why we want to ensure that we get this principle correct is because it does not hamper decision making in the state. So um, as part of that process, we've been engaging uh, with the Auditor General. We've also engaged um, um, legal counsel in that regard. But in the same breath, we don't want to unnecessarily litigate against the Auditor General. So partly because the SIU in its report also made uh, findings on whether it is fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Um, as the DG also has indicated, there is still a fundamental disagreement on whether um, that expenditure is fruitless and wasteful expenditure. But it goes back to what is the principle underlying when you have a valid binding contract and you are obliged under that contract to pay maintenance and support, what do you do in that circumstance? And when you go back to the PFMA, and try to unpack that principle, um, that is really where the heart of the dispute is. When you have a legally binding contract, what do you do in that case? So uh, this is a matter that's still uh, ongoing. It won't have a matter, uh, it won't have an uh, adverse impact on the audit outcome, uh, but this is something that we are still engaging the Auditor General on. My last point is that uh, we do have a number of disagreements that we work with the Auditor General. Um, our relationship is quite cordial, very professional, very co collaborative, um, and we ensure that when there are disputes in the system or disagreements in the system, we work together to resolve it. And once again, with this particular matter, we are trying to find how best uh, we resolve this, this matter. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, DM, and then Babum Tib. Thanks once more, Chair. So, except um, on the implementation of certain modules, uh, e.g. the e-recruitment by TPSA, uh, which from my understanding they want to proceed outside this IFMS, um, on condition from the National Treasury's point of view, on condition that such a system will be uh, compatible at some stage with IFMS. Uh, except on that issue, I think the, the, this a clear way forward on what we need to do there. But other issues, uh, they seem to be contingent on two things. The first one is the SIU um, report still has to consider the representations that we have to make or we are making as um, national uh, treasury and 
for, let's say, they consider our representations favorably, I take it that their findings may have to be reconsidered. If that doesn't happen, it means that the matter will have to be ventilated in a legal platform, which is a tribunal. And there's two possible outcomes there. One outcome is for that legal platform where this matter will be articulated. Uh, the po one possible outcome is that, okay, the contract is valid. SIU, you are incorrect. Treasury, you are right. And that would have saved us a burden um, of this service provider having to take us to court and say you've terminated our contract illegally. And there are claims that a service provider can make on the state on the basis that you have terminated a contract illegally. If the outcome of that legal dispute is that, yes, this contract is invalid, well, both parties might decide to take the matter to other levels, appeal and all that. Suppose they agree. We agree that, yes, this contract is invalid. It means that we terminate. Um, and it doesn't stop the service provider to take us head on uh, as the state. So if argument's sake, we agree all of us that, look, this contract is invalid, and therefore we need to terminate it, but we need the service. Um, we're just whispering with Advocate Mutivi here, was giving one <coughs> example of um, ESCOM, in which is it ABB, where we said the contract is invalid, but ESCOM needs the system. So ABB continue. However, when the contract comes to an end, you go. Um, so that's one possibility. But the issue is, what do we do uh, in between? We could say, OK, should we wait for all these legal processes to go on? Um, and precisely because we need this uh, system in the meantime, to avoid disruptions and all that, w w what do you do under those circumstances? And another example, which we're just whispering amongst ourselves here, and it's good that we're sitting next to each other, it's the example of the SASA, in which the court said, this is invalid, but in the meantime, we want you to find an alternative to deal with this issue. So. Um, how we move forward, Chair, uh, like I said, and therefore once we agree that in the meantime, while all these issues are being sorted out, there will be issues about how do you treat the payment of the maintenance, uh, the services, and that's where that issue between us and the AG uh, need to be, to be sorted out. So I'm afraid, Chair, that um, this meeting may not be able to provide a clear way forward on all those issues because there are a lot of dependencies. Um, how we move forward is contingent upon how we basically deal with those uh, three uh, elements. Um, so to the extent that this meeting uh, has provided update and the complexities of the matter on how we basically move forward. I think it was, it is from my point of view, very useful and very progressive and it was necessary that we do uh, meet. But I do think that uh, we do need to find a way of, amongst ourselves as different state organs, on how do we proceed on these matters. Uh, it may not be, before um, the 
It may be after the election. I'm, I'm not so sure. But let, let's, we'll also get guidance from you, Chair, and the committee on the timelines within which uh, we deal with this issue, even though some of the issues may be beyond um, our control in terms of how these legal processes uh, basically uh, move. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Baba um, No, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, uh, really, just to pick up on what the DM has said, uh, yes, there are you know, various, various legal variables um, which, which could be considered to sort of assist on a legal basis the process forward. Uh, so, as we sit now, just to really answer your question, Chair, on the uh, bullet point that says SCM process not followed. The consequence of that finding is that uh, we will, as I indicated, we will institute civil proceedings to cancel the contract and recover. But the DG makes a, a, a mention of a legal uh, status. The legal status in our country is that the contract remains valid until it's set aside, you know, cancelled and set aside. But of course, in this, in this circumstances, uh, the, 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 the context is that, you know, National Treasury says, you know, we, 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 are, we are disagreeing that this contract was entered with irregularity and therefore, you know, uh, would possibly not institute a process to terminate the contract. Uh, well, <clears throat> in other instances where we have made these similar findings and the State Department agrees with us, over and above us instituting the civil proceedings, they then kick the contractual provision to terminate the contract. So that's a separate process. So, so in this instance, it, it, it does not apply. So it means we will proceed, institute the civil proceedings, they will get court papers or special tribunal papers, National Treasury, uh, Oracle will be cited, you know, uh, National Treasury will be cited, and that process will proceed. Uh, and and will, of course, argue our cases uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the special tribunal. But that does not say, you know, these possibilities that the DM has indicated cannot be engaged upon uh, to find, you know, w what is in the meantime that could be done to sort of assist the operation side. There's a business to run, uh, but there's also these legal processes that are ongoing. And hence the referral to an examples of ABB, uh, which is, a, which is a really a good example that we have referred to. Uh, if a finding of the similar nature was made, and as Kong said, oh, if we take ABB out of the power station, there's gonna be problems and so on. Uh, so the parties sat down Right, which uh, at the time included National Treasury as well. And then there was a, there, there was a scenario that, that, that was reached uh, that assisted the process forward. I'm saying it's, it's similar, perhaps not the same, but, but, uh, but, but there, are, there, there is an opportunity to engage around that similar scenario. Uh, similarly to the, uh, the matter uh, of, of Sasa, there are elements, there are elements of that. So, so those were presented really as matters upon which parties can engage uh, from now uh, to say, you know, well, how, how do we engage so that we respect each other's processes and possibly assist the business uh, to, to, to deliver. Um, <clears throat> uh, Honorable Lees, on the five disciplinary referrals and the NPA referrals, uh, at the risk of repeating uh, ourselves that uh, uh, would, would not be able to mention the names unless you know, the, the criminal process has taken its course and the people have been charged, similar to the, to the DCs as well. Uh, hopefully hopefully uh, that, that will happen soon. The blacklisting, uh, the question was whether what was based on the malfeasance on the part of Oracle we did make a finding of conflict of interest. And that conflict of interest runs between 
you know, an official or some of the officials and Oracle, and that we will unpack when the matters go to, to, the, to, the, to the forum uh, as, we, as we argue our case. And based on that, uh, we had then found uh, that the process, the SCM process, amongst other findings, uh, was, uh, was irregularly affected. Um, <clears throat> uh, Honorable, Honorable Mayi, on other companies, uh, I quickly just checked with my colleagues. Uh, there were no other companies that were investigated with the exception of Oracle. There are other companies that bid it uh, for, this, for this system, but they were not, they were not investigated. But the principle you're making, it's, it, it's indeed true that if there were other companies that, were, that allegations were made against and they were investigated and the process is completed against them, either way, they should be informed, uh, just so that there's certainty. We agree with that. Um, timelines to the presidential report. Uh, uh, the, we were working on that, uh, on that report, so um, uh, I, I'm looking at not beyond uh, the end of April that we should finalize, finalize that, uh, that, that report. Um, the, the point that you, were, that you asked, uh, Honorable Mani, and uh, no, it's not IFMS related, but now that it's asked, I think we are duty bound to respond. Uh, the, the, the Fort Hare investigation. Uh, that investigation is ongoing. It's also reaching its own findings and so on. Uh, and as you correctly indicated, that uh, uh, after the interdict was uh, obtained, that we could not investigate uh, the, how the, the, the master's degrees. Uh, the court clearly indicated that uh, the scope of the proclamation did not cover the masters, and the court also intimated that you know, SIU could get an amendment of the proclamation, which is something we do in the ordinary run of our business. So then we prepared the amendment, which we submitted to the Department of Justice on the 7th of July, 2023, for the proclamation to be processed. Because remember, it gets processed through the Department of Justice and then to the Minister of Justice, and then the Minister of Justice processes it uh, to, the, to, to the President. Um. Yeah, Chair, uh, I, th I think I've covered uh, all, all the points. Honorable Hatebehen asked about the implications of the non-submission. I use, I'm paraphrasing him, that what's the status of the findings ahead oh. of the non-submission oh, of sorry. the report to the President. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Honorable, uh, Honorable Hadebe, uh, the when, as I indicated, uh, when we investigate, and every time a pre, uh, the, the, the evidence is gathered during the investigation, and this is a typical example of that, in this investigation, we have found that the contract is irregular. So we need to act uh, and, and, and cancel it. We will start the pro that process, special tribunal, and the process will proceed, similar to the disciplinary processes, blacklisting, and so on. So when we submit the report to the president, we make, we make mention of that, indicate the status of where they are. The president has at no time, uh, and in fact has respected the legal due process, uh, so that uh, at the end of those processes, we do go back to the president and say, this civil proceedings was undertaken, has been concluded, and these are the results, uh, similar, to other, similar to other outcomes uh, that, 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 uh, that would have been undertaken. Uh, so, so really the president doesn't need to support or not support uh, the outcomes. Uh, it's based on legal processes relating to specific outcomes. Uh, I'm not sure if I would have covered it uh, appropriately. Okay, I'll come to Honorable Hatteba momentarily. Um, National Treasury, I'm going to make a very bold statement. 
it seems to me that this is the hill you are prepared to die on. Because in July 2015, National Treasury's Audit Committee requested the Internal Audit Unit to perform a review of the IFMS payments for 14-15 financial year. The Internal Audit Investigation revealed a total of 54 findings, of which 49 had catastrophic risk ratings and five had high risk ratings. The investigation indicated weaknesses in internal controls to mitigate the risks and weak monitoring systems. The internal audit in investigations indicated that internal controls could not be relied on. The audit committee presented the report to the then accounting officer in National Treasury in March 2016 and formally requested an independent forensic investigation. Deloitte was awarded the tender on 1 October 2015. Deloitte found no wrongdoing by National Treasury's officials working on the IFMS project. The only conclusion that was made was that there was a lack of human resource was partly to blame for the adverse findings on the internal audit investigation. Then, the forensic report by Deloitte was rejected by the audit committee. A new tender was issued for the forensic investigation and Nexus was awarded the contract on 1 February 2018. Nexus completed the investigation and the report was submitted to National Treasury on 28 August 2018. That report highlighted the following. One, irregular expenditure to the tune of 273 million rands. Two, non-compliance with SCM processes. Three, poor documentation of, of crucial contract information. Four, lack of project management controls. Five, payment of license fees for licenses not being used, fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Six, weaknesses in internal controls. Seven, lack of formal business case for the IFMS project, and eight, insufficient resources to fully implement the IFMS project. Now the SIU comes and says the contract is irregular. You disagree. So it's a case of everybody's wrong and that you are right. That's why we are here. These were investigations at your insistence that were, came out of your processes. And because you didn't like the outcomes, you rejected them. Now the SIU comes and makes a similar finding of irregular SCM processes. The AG is wrong, you don't agree with their findings. There's now a negotiation about uh, the outcome to say that um, no, the comparative uh, numbers and so on and so forth, and so there will be no qualification. Now you disagree with the SIU and uh, you don't uh, accept their findings. What do you accept? This revolving door that you are playing before us is, quite frankly, as I see it, totally unacceptable. And I think it's reckless and irresponsible coming from National Treasury. That processes that you initiated arrive at conclusions, you reject them, and then when an independent body arrives at similar conclusions, you don't agree. You don't agree with the AG. You don't accept the issues around the irregular expenditure, the fruitless and wasteful expenditure. DM, this sits as a, a clearing indictment on National Treasury and is material in why we are here. And something has got to give. Because whether we like it or not, IFMS has become an albatross to the fiscus. Whether monies were not paid in the last financial year, yeah, that's, yeah, that's nice. 
But how consequential is that in the greater scheme of things? So that's why I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to, 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 to wrap my head around Sigupi. You see, what this reminds me of, because we all venturing down memory lane, is the typical case of the road accident fund, where they change the accounting standard. The ASB tells them that they shouldn't have, AG tells them that they shouldn't have, the accountant general tells them that they shouldn't have, we did an assessment here to them that they should not have done so, but they insist that they're right. And now we're going to adopt some sort of a Hambagatle rescue mission along the lines of Sasa, a example, the ABB, what we were saying Prasa should have done. To, to, to create a crisis or to res, resist responding to investigations and outcomes. And then to say, well, we still have to do something. I, 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 can't, I can't get my head around how this can come from National Treasury. The authors and crafters of National Treasury regulations who give guidance to the broader ecosystem of public finance management this can't be you. So Deloitte had an investigation, Nexus had an investigation, SIU has an investigation, there's AG audit outcomes. You disagree with all of them? Uh -uh. Honorable Hatebe, Honorable Somi, Honorable Man. Th thank you, Chair. I think we are, we are being um, delayed by technicalities or procedural matters. Why I'm saying that, Chair, we now know that the report has been completed, but there is no final report that has been submitted to the President. Now, National Treasury is saying they are waiting for the final report. Yet, from the SIU, it's clear that the content won't change. But for National Treasury to act, there has to be a final report. That's, that, that's a technicality. Uh, hence, I ask the question, uh, what then happens upon the president receiving the report? Is he expected to study, accept, or reject in order for the report to be referred as being the final product? So is National Treasury, in essence, waiting for the report to be furnished to the president and, to, and the president to confirm or pronounce on the status of the report? Hence, they are saying the completion of the SIU will inform the way forward. So you can't have a way forward. Now, that, that, that's a technicality because the question that I was asking is that will the legal processes that have unfolded and the findings change. And you are saying, based on, on history, it has not happened that, um, President, uh, a change was contained in, in the report. So now we are being delayed because of technicalities. Um, how soon can the report be finished to the President? And what then becomes the process and procedure once you have tabled your report to the president? Is it only after the president has given you a go ahead that you will be able to finish the report to the relevant parties? Because I'm, I, I'm trying to drive to a stage where um, National Treasury acts on, on, on the report. And I guess um, listening to them, it might be unfair, I don't know, uh, that's my take. It might be unfair to act uh, on, on a report that has not been declared final. I don't know. I'm trying to put myself into their shoes and their thinking around this matter. But I think they would have sufficient knowledge and understanding in terms of how proclamation works and the finding contained thereof and when to act and when not to act. I think 
they should at this current juncture they should be aware of such and technicalities shouldn't be used to prolong the inevitable but from their response it's clear that they are saying no we don't we're not happy with your outcomes we're going to challenge so we are again prolonging the inevitable to action uh, challenging the content of, of, of the report. So I think the sooner we, 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 uh, we get an understanding of the final report being made final, uh, the, the better for them to act. But it's quite disappointing uh, that National Treasury will resort into technical aspect in remedying this situation. Thank you, Chair. In fact, Honorable Hattabe, on slide 15, it's the SIU categorically says, after thorough review and evaluation process of the representations, the SIU advised National Treasury on 22 March that it still holds the same position and therefore the SIU's findings stand. Babu Somi. No, th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Um, the, 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 the outlook is worrisome. Um, if I were, were going to focus on the SIU uh, structure of things, I would, I would take another turn. But my focus is on um, the functionality uh, of treasuries, performance related approach or systems. You go to cabinet, 2005. Cabinet is Shalelepa. You say, Cabinet, here we are, IFMS 205. You go back to Cabinet 2013. Here we are, with a revised approach, and Cabinet trusts you, grants you uh, that right. SIU just arrives 2020, uh, to, be, to be accurate. SIU comes with a gazetted proclamation uh, 31st January 2020. Even at that time, nothing. And the second point of their own investigation is your failure to come with outcomes on what you came to cabinet 2005. And, and at that time, you were 15 years, 15 years with no product on the table. So, 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 so what are you actually, actually there for in this matter? Because your failure is making others to fail. See, the story of DPSA is up in this matter, that uh, we really need our HR integrated system. We have been looking into this mountain treasury. Come with it to us. But for 15 years before SIU intervenes, no product. Is there any way that you can prove to us that for that failure, that, that failure alone, you have taken action. What sort of action you have you taken? Even before SIU was there, your own audit committee takes a decision to say something is wrong here, the audit committee. So as an accounting officer, as an accounting officer, have you look into the back of the trade and say, what is it that we ought to have done by that time? Lest you're part of a problem. So, so, so those kinds of uh, things ought to be looked into to enhance uh, the functionality of the system because the system failure gets into others. CETA is involved. We say, no, CETA is in, uh, there's no uh, clear activity from CETA side. They were here last time said, no, 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 we're ready. We're only disappointed by an action from Treasury side. The same uh, with DPSA, the letter from the former minister, which was withdrawing 
the DPSC rule because there was no action. Before SIU was there. So that's why I wouldn't like us to uh, be drawn into the SIU Treasury's uh, dispute. But the fact is, for the period, you spent money, no product, no results. And when others are saying that was irregular from your side, you know, you become a log to jam the actual accountability process. So those are the kinds of things that we must look into and begin to say, in your role as an accounting officer, what is it that you're taking responsibility on, on these matters? Leave, uh, let's leave SIU uh, processes alone, the legal processes, but the administrative processes to ensure that what you went to cabinet on, you hold your word based uh, on the initial cabinet memo, which cabinet agreed on. So that, that's, that's where I am. Uh, you see, matters of uh, SIU and your justice and all that kind of thing, those are other, uh, other matters. Uh, you know, so, so let us not be drawn uh, uh, into, uh, into such, uh, uh, you know. Now, your matters that relate to accountability frame, consequence management. Now you tell us I'm going to go to court. If you failed at that court, consequently, are you taking responsibility for a failure at the court? If you fail, let, let's, say, let's say you go to court and fail. Consequently, are you taking responsibility as an accounting officer? Those are the kinds of things that we must look at. Government is at a standstill because you can't produce IFMS on the table. You went to cabinet. It might have been that, uh, well, cabinet would say, let's change the responsibility. It goes to uh, monitoring and evaluation. It's no longer with, with treasury. And something else uh, would happen there. So on this project, we are holding government at ransom. The court processes take their own time. So you're saying government must be held into such for longer the chain, I call. Ngozi Chairman. Mpop, Babu Man. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me just uh, clean up one point about the out of scope before I get to the issue. I, I didn't mean the out of scope in the sense you were describing. Uh, that is an obvious one. I was talking about the out of scope of something that should really be in scope. Uh, an example, I mean, if you look at, let's say, the, the HR module as an example, uh, if you had a, a module that had to do whatever, uh, and then somebody in the HR department decides that, okay, just to fine tune this, can we have a, a, what shall I call a program or something to to be able to compute this particular uh, something. Uh, you know, just a subset of what is already there. That's what I'm talking about uh, with these IT things that I have found that uh, generally those things don't seem to be even anticipated. So then you end up with a subset being called out of scope and being costed additionally. I have a problem with this. So I'm, I, I was trying to get to a point where you as national treasurer get into a system in place that uh, we don't have these kinds of things. I mean, I can give an example at the Department of Labor, there was a Siemens project uh, that had to do transversal execution. Uh, and next thing, uh, every little thing that you needed to do was deemed out of scope. So you have a monthly fee that you are paying for Siemens, but you've got the day-to-day uh, thing that to do. Uh, so that's the out of scope I'm talking about, not 
not, not, not to us. So that's the one so to say, do we have a system in place to make sure that that doesn't happen? But apart from the chairperson, I think what, what we're dealing with here, we're dealing with a, a few adjectives to, 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 deal, to talk about this. I think we're dealing with an animal farm issue. Uh, we're dealing with uh, an arrogant department here called the uh, National Treasury, a department that is a law unto itself, a department that has adopted the Stalingrad strategy. It does not want to be held accountable by anyone. Actually, the whole country is afraid of National Treasury. This audit report, Chair, of the internal audit report, I tabled it myself at the Zondo Commission as because at that time, in 2018 already, Scopa of that time had, pu had put a figure of 1.8 billion. And the expression in that PMG report was that 1.8 billion down the drain. This is the expression at, Sco at Scopa, 1.8 billion down the drain without no value. On this, I take this thing because I thought Zondo was interested in these kinds of things. Uh, but obviously he was following individuals and not evidence. Even though I put evidence there to Zondo to say, here is something that needs to be followed. But because National Treasury is uh, uh, untouchable, nobody wants to touch National Treasury, I don't know why. And we're sitting in this mess here, all because of the rogue activities within National Treasury, and no, no one seems to want to deal with it. Uh, and I actually don't think sitting here with the DG is going to give us anything because he is uh, resigned to defend uh, as it were. So he's going to be sitting here and defending the, all these institutions, uh, be it SIU, be it his own internal audit, be it AG. The AG is the apex on matters of uh, fruitless and wasteful ex expenditure. It's an ex apex body. When that institution pronounces, everybody listens, except National Treasury. I mean, we can't have a situation like this. Even now, they are gearing to, to find all kinds of loopholes with the report. Now they say, okay, we wait and see the final report. And when the final report comes, then they're going to have another issue. No, we don't think so. We can't operate like this. I honestly don't think it's going to uh, add any value to say the DG uh, must respond or anything. I think what this committee should do, it should uh, find a way to say, how do we deal with this uh, rogue behavior of a national treasury that is a, a law unto itself? And in the process, billions of friends are lost. Uh, and, and I think a, a question was asked, whether it's by you, Chair, if this rogue activity that is here was happening in another department, that particular DG would have been suspended by now. Every, some, uh, something would have happened and at the instigation of National Treasury, they would have been on top of it and, and be behaving like a paragons of a virtue uh, and all of that on top of some other DG. But this time it's them and, and they don't want to be held accountable. So, Chairperson, I really want to appeal to this committee that uh, we must put treasury on the crosshairs. It's treasury, it's treasury that uh, is messing up the entire system 20 years. And it's, it's 20 years counting. Well, it's not like the end is in sight. The end is not in sight because they are squaring to challenge even the report that's going to come, you know? So, so, so I, I, I just wanted to make those points here to say, I think it's a waste of time to say DG must respond and whatever. He's going to defend. I mean, the accountant general sitting next to him is his staff member or somewhere in his uh, organogram. So they are going to agree with each other. So what's the point uh, here, Chairperson? So I really just think that uh, we should note uh, all these reports and everything, and there should be a clear decision of how do we deal with this rogue department that is supposed to be supervising others. This is a problem because they are very hard on all other departments. Why is it that uh, we have a situation here where National Treasury itself, having messed up billions of rents, uh, that it doesn't look like anybody wants to take action on them? Even Zondo does not want to do anything. In his report, 
This is submitted in his uh, report. I submitted it myself, uh, so I know this for a fact. Even Zondo is afraid of, of national treasury. So who must touch national treasury then if uh, nobody must, uh, must deal with them? So I really think uh, the elephant in the room is national treasury. It's an arrogant department. It can do no wrong. Uh, nobody, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, you, 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 the, the AG is not a political body. This is an independent apex body of audit. If you argue with them on the definition of a fruitless and wasteful expenditure, then really, who, 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 which side must we take? The SIU chairperson has made four concrete findings. They find irregular SCM processes. They find non-compliance with SCM policies and legislation. They find conflict of interest. They find fruitless and wasteful expenditure. This is, this, uh, the, the, the SIU uh, reports, I'm not aware of many things that they would have lost in various tribunals. They are very thorough. Uh, I'm not just saying it because they are here. They are very thorough, Chairperson, uh, these people. And they've got no uh, vested interest in anything. They just want the truth. They just want to make sure that uh, uh, nothing goes wrong in the public service. Now, if you have institutions like that and you undermine them because of one particular department, it's a problem. We can't put institutions in place that are meant to be watchdogs and then undermine those principles. So as I close, Chair, I really think we should uh, be taking a very clear position on how to deal with the rogue behavior of, uh, of National Treasury. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, let's go to National Treasury. Um, uh, let, let DG start. Okay, sure. That's fine. DG. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to respond to a few of the questions raised, um, uh, the, the question by Honourable Adebe on the issue of the of the report. Our um, uh, legal advice, Chair, has been very clear. We are constrained from doing anything until we have a final report. And the understanding in that regard is a final report that is submitted to the president. Um, once that takes place, then the various um, uh, options that have been uh, put on the table can be discussed. Uh, and I think that's, a, a, um, a, 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 that's, that's uh, I, I think, the, the um, best way to answer that. In terms of the actions that have been taken on IFMS itself. Um, what we started doing last year was in order to break, firstly, we, we've obviously on an ongoing basis been reporting to SCOPA on the delays on IFMS implementation. What we started uh, in 2023 was to say that despite the challenges that we have, let's um, enter into a process to renegotiate the contract so that it can move forward. Um, and we've reported on that before. Um, and the, the renegotiation process really focused on two issues. The one was we've made an initial investment into IFMS, an initial fiscal outlay, in order to obtain better value for money for that, uh, the negotiation centered around recouping that investment in the form of a credit from the service provider that we can use going forward. Um, in order to deal with this challenge around the outlay that had been taken place without um, uh, any uh, progress in terms of the implementation on, of the system. We also started uh, discussions with the service provider around how we can shift to a cloud-based solution that can get us better outcomes and better value for money. So in terms of the question of what has been done, those uh, steps started being taken in 2023. The challenge arose from our perspective in terms of the SIU investigation and what that means for the contract. Um, and we felt it prudent and received legal advice in this regard uh, that it, we should not continue with those renegotiations until the SIU report and process has been finalized and then we can, we can take it from there. Um, in the meantime, what the team has been doing
is thinking about what defamation post all of actually look like because our priority is to learn from um, the lessons of the last number of years and be able to implement a system um, that does not prejudice the fact that we have a legally binding contract and a process is underway in this regard, but we can actually uh, get to the outcome, which is an integrated financial management system to replace the legacy systems. So from our point of view, um, those uh, we were not idly sitting by, uh, and that's why we did the renegotiation process. However, as soon as this process is done, we can then take the next steps uh, to expedite whatever a solution on IFMS uh, looks like. Jay. And, and certainly, uh, that is the commitment that I'm making as someone who stepped in uh, to this role in September last year uh, with Shabir having joined uh, not too long before and having to grapple with how do you take this uh, matter forward in an environment where there is a pending SIU investigation. Thank you. TM? want to say something? Okay, it's fine. No, thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, uh, Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, perhaps as the DM uh, uh, comments would take into account what we say. Uh, what happens after the President receives the report? You know, I think this, this seems to be something that really we need to clarify. I, I have said, and I need to repeat, that the findings that we make, even before the president's report is submitted, those stand. And those, those, those have got a legal standing, right? They have in themselves legal standing. If we have made a finding that the contract is irregular, based on that we are able to institute civil proceedings, even before the president's report is submitted. Let's assume we, we uh, well, as we say with that, we're aiming to submit the report in April. Assuming we institute the proceedings first week of April, there's no one who will come and stand up in court and say, no, this proceedings cannot proceed because the president's report has not been submitted. You know? Uh, so that part is finalized. So whatever decisions need to be made has to be made based on the findings that we have made. There is absolutely no need to wait for the president's report because the findings are final. And there are judgments out there uh, that we can make. You know, uh, in the PPE environment, there were, judge there were findings that we made before the final report of the president, and those findings had legal standing. Uh, so, so I think we, it's, it's important to clarify that part. Um, how soon can the president's report? We are, we're, because now of all this, we had, we had, we had uh, post that to really complete this representation period will speed up the finalization of the president's report. But I repeat, it's not going to change the standing, the legal standing of the, of the, of the findings. Um, uh, Chair, just to, just to really reiterate, uh, uh, in the process of the investigations, I mean, it happens in various instances where we go in state institutions that there would have been some other investigations and audit finding. We do take those into account. But of course, at the end of it, we come out with our independent findings. Uh, so in this regard, and I'm glad the Honorable Chair has made reference to those uh, previous, previous, uh, previous reports of Deloitte, Nexus, and the AG findings, uh, we, 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 in, in the process of investigating and looking at the information, we looked at those, but we arrived at independent finding as the SIU. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, DM? No, thanks very much, Chair. I'm sorry, DM Finance. Yeah. I said DM and oh. all the DMs tend this way. <laughs> but DM Finance. <laughs> no, thanks very much, Chair and honorable members. I, I do think that this feedback um, has been very useful. Um, to us as National Treasury. And what I will suggest, Chair, as a way forward is that um, you, you give us a moment to go and reflect 
uh, on this. May I? <laughs> um, in the light of the comments, which are very clear, in the light of the comments that the committee has made, and uh, how you feel about the way in which this matter has dragged and the way we have responded. So if you could give us a moment to go and reflect and we'll come with the suggested way forward uh, even before the report is submitted uh, to the president in the light of what advocate has just said now um, and also take into account the previous reports uh, on this matter. Um, you just have to guide us on the time within which we need to come back to you with some kind of a way forward on this matter. Because I do think that we need an internal conversation within Treasury um, on how we should take forward um, this matter in the light of your comments and uh, suggestions that you've made uh, as the committee. Um, I'm not um, in a position to suggest the particular time frame within which we need to come back to the committee on how we think we should go forward in the light of the comments that you have, uh, you have made, uh, Chair. I'm trying to consult the mm. parliamentary program here because we are competent until the 28th of, of May. And of course, we'll have to beg the indulgence of the uh, presiding officers in so far as whatever latitude or leeway will be given to us. So we will engage the House Chairperson responsible for committees so that at the very least we just conclude on this particular aspect with a clear roadmap uh, in terms of what uh, needs to happen because the, the constituency period goes up until the 21st of May. Uh, but we can ask for a special uh, dispensation. So I'll engage the House Chairperson, uh, colleagues, and see what is practical and feasible so that at least this matter is just, there's a, a conclusion on it, uh, a, a, a roadmap uh, to take it forward. Mazamban. Mr. Chairman, I, I think that that is entirely in order, but what I want to clarify is that we, we're asking National Treasury to come back to us with a roadmap. From what I've been hearing this morning, they don't now need to consult with the SIU. They know exactly where the SIU is. They've got the findings. There's no more talking needed there. They don't need to talk to the DPSA because there's a process going there. They already, and it, it might form part of the report back, but it's not really the essential thing of the big picture. Um, is my assessment correct? This is now we're asking National Treasury to come back to us, and I think the Deputy Minister is indicating the same same way. In fact, I've got another suggestion that just came to mind, but let me go to Honorable Hadebe, and then I just want to make a proposal when you're done, which may help us. No, I wanted to understand how much time do they think they need so that they don't come back and say, well, the time you've given us was not sufficient to come with something tangible. Masibu uh, Sele Kubo. Mabeti, August 2024. How? Ganjan. No. No, with the understanding. With the understanding which I said. Bye. <laughs> Chair, <laughs> thanks. After consulting with the DG, uh, the proposal or the request we want to make with regard to time, it's three weeks. Within three weeks, we should come back to the committee, if that's okay. Right. 
Yes. No, I just wanted to just check maybe with SIU that uh, if it's easy to mention that Oracle is blacklisted or whatever, uh, what's different with the individuals? I mean, it's also a juristic person that is just mentioned. What, what's the difference between Oracle and the other individuals that you, you are afraid to tell us? All right, let's conclude on this timeline. All right, so the mother I'm gonna request you to is that uh, in my head, I had 14 days, but okay, it's fine. It's uh, Passover season. I'm going to request that we get a, a written report uh, in 21 days' time so that we can have a basis upon which to continue engaging with the presiding officers. However, I must hasten to say we postponed three weeks ago at the behest of National Treasury seeking to consult. So <clears throat> I say that with, to, to draw your attention, Uguti, we can't keep on kick, kicking for touch like this. So can we get your response? Uh, in 14 days, we will get our secretary to liaise with the PLO um, so that we, we can be able to sort of uh, tie this one uh, down. DM, DPSA, we'll come to the issues you've raised, Babu Mani, just now. DM? Uh, thank you, Chair. As you're concluding, uh, I don't know whether you wanted to give uh, Dr. Mani first the opportunity to say what he was saying, but I just wanted to uh, say that we do appreciate uh, what you're actually putting forward in in the sense that uh, DPSA should actually try and move ahead uh, with processes that are required around HRM. Um, and maybe to say that um, they need to develop an integrated HRM system that should actually uh, be taken. Okay, am I now audible? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually saying as you, we, you are concluding, uh, we appreciate what you're putting forward in terms of really um, giving uh, DPSA ability to manage to continue uh, around HRM uh, systems. And uh, I would agree with the, uh, with the, um, the DG on, or, uh, who actually indicates that because these matters are actually decided at, at, at cabinet level, where what, what it means is that there should be an integrated human rights management framework that should actually then be prepared uh, for cabinet. Uh, but earlier it was indicated that it's about e-recruitment. It's not only about e-recruitment, it's about a whole lot of other matters that are HR related, like the uh, performance management development system, the leave management system, the organizational structure, HR planning, uh, and HR administration and operations. So we, we appreciate where the process is now. It's unfortunate what has happened has actually happened in the past, uh, but for, for the Department of Public Service and Administration, um, I think we do agree with the fact that maybe if we are actually allowed to proceed with the work that needs to be done, uh, that will actually make it easier for us. Thank you. No, thanks, Demo. We're still going to give the DMs an opportunity to make concluding remarks as soon as we are done with all the, the issues. So we'll come to you and you can uh, wrap it up. But I think National Treasury hears also the agency that DPSA is placing on the matter, that technological capabilities of 2005 when I was in metric are far different to the technological capabilities of 2024, and that the delays are now catching up with us. Uh, in terms of where uh, we should be. Yeah, I'm that young. Um, Babu Mtib, uh, there was an issue that Babu Umani raised. Um, I think the, the DM um, is certainly important. The qualification there, uh, even on your presentation, 
that you need an independent system, which might be integrated later. But I don't want us to move out of here and say, okay, National Treasury could push Oracle to handle your a integrated HR system. Uh, you know, that's not what we're saying. We're saying it on the strength uh, of what you said, uh, that so long you continue uh, with independently and then you get into whatever it is uh, on the integration uh, somewhat. I think uh, we must uh, take that qualification along uh, in consideration of that. Thank you, through your chair, point noted. And maybe to say that uh, it needs to be costed with assistance of Treasury. Okay. Mabum uh, Tibi, um, no, let thank me you. hear your response first before I bail you Thank out. you, Honorable Chair. Uh, what we have said is that uh, <clears throat> we do mention parties when matters, one way or another, are in public in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the findings. It is public knowledge that this contract is between Oracle and National Treasury. So to that extent, uh, it is clear uh, that uh, the public is aware, and we have mentioned that Oracle has been referred, based on our findings, uh, for blacklisting. And again, blacklisting uh, has its own process that it, uh, that it follows. Thank you. I can just say before, I'm not bailing him out per se, is to say that at times we have understood to say investigations or cases may be at initial stage and may be given time. We have received names before, um, so the, there's, there's always been that, and that's why when the matter was raised, sort of when he said that we kind of got him. So at times it's been that maybe it's at initial phase, and an investigation not to be prejudiced or to give a heads up. But I think as the reports come out, we will be able to get those. I want to just say two things. Of course, we, we, we remain uh, here seized with a matter of the development of the reporting matrix of SIU reports by the presidents. Um, <clears throat> so to say to Treasury, a reliance on a presidency submitted report it, it may really be a box ticking exercise in the greater scheme of things in the sense that we picked up a lacuna here. There are reports dating as far back as 2001 sitting with the presidents and we are seized with the presidency now at our insistence developing a reporting matrix given the complexity of the investigation space and what may arise out of reports. So for example, a report about Department X may touch on the municipality on one aspect and an SOE on the other. There has to be a concerted coordination about how recommendations of the diversity of the space. And so what the SIU is doing to say as and when information arises or evidence is presented, they proceed, must also be understood in that context that there's a lacuna in the presidency, but we are quite certain that we'll, we'll close it off now. Uh, there's progress uh, in, in, in that regard. The second and final point, Treasury, don't invite trouble for yourselves in the sense that you be the ones to set into motion precedents which will come back to frustrate you as the national treasury and the work that you do for public finance management. Because people tend to mirror what those in authority do. Oh, national treasury is having these kind of pushbacks. Then they imitate it. The strength of leadership, as you now lead public finances, is to admit when you are wrong and then institute the corrective action. This fishing expedition doesn't sit well with us. It's 20 years later. I was in grade 12. One gentleman in our class of 205 is planning our 20-year reunion, and I felt very old. 
So I don't know about some of you in this room if I'm feeling old. <laughs> so you see, honestly, honestly speaking, you, you, you can't have a project within the purview of National Treasury handled like this. Because where's the standard? Where's the model? Because then everybody is justified. Metupi, Kusile, and all these housing projects throughout the country. Because if you are not committed to your own commitments and your own timelines, you invite scope creep, cost escalations, corruption, and all sorts of other things. Because the other question remains, is IFMS still suited for the times? And it's, if you look at the technological advancements that take play, have taken place over the past 20 years, there was no Twitter in 2005. None. There's now chat GBT, whatever that, whatever. This, 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 this just, it, in your reflections, DM, please reflect on that as well, on what this means for the collective integrity of national treasury in the greater scheme of things as the North Star. We will hold the national treasury to a higher standard because you also in one way become players and referees when you can discharge national treasury notes and instruction notes and so on and so forth. You have got that advantage which nobody else has. Now it must sit as an indictment on you that you have got a project of this magnitude in your purview 20 years later, it's not done. And is riddled with all sorts of things. And now another conclusion saying that the process was irregular. You have to get past this. Because if national treasury collapses, then the country is in serious trouble. I could use stronger language. So please, let's, 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 let's really resolve this thing. 21 days, a written report. I will engage the presiding officers so long um, so that this matter uh, moves. Uh, any concluding remarks, DM, DPSA? Uh, thank you, Chair. I think uh, I've actually also, uh, already concluded with the remarks I've just made now, but we do appreciate uh, the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. DM comes because we still have to come back to that CETA problem at some point. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you can see that uh, we don't really play much role here on this matter of uh, IFMS. We, we really are spectators, we've been spectating uh, the rest of this morning, but it's valuable input, uh, good interactions that we are observing today. I forgot to indicate that with me, I've got uh, the chairperson of uh, CETA, uh, Mr. Kiruben Pile, next to me, and the acting CEO, and together with some staff members. So I forgot to mention that uh, I'm with this delegation. But Chair, just to say that uh, I think we have succinctly put the, the question around the evolution of technology and the rapid pace at which technology is evolving. Quite spot on. The things that we're relying on in the past, you can even say past five years, those solutions are no longer applicable now because things are moving at a very fast pace. We now have a generative AI which is capable of doing a lot of uh, things, which can even emulate you speaking without you raising your voice. So things are moving at that pace. I'm not saying that uh, the service provider is not capable of supplying the latest technological technology that we require, but 
just to emphasize and buttress the point you are making that things are moving very fast, even ourselves. We are, uh, we are grappling with all this movement. Uh, CETA is uh, uh, proceeding to enable government uh, in a number of areas, e-government and all of that. So I'm sure at an appropriate point we'll have that conversation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Babum uh, TV? Uh, nothing more from us, oh, Honorable Chair. Thank you. Very much. DM Finance? No, thanks, Chair. Um, we hold ourselves to the high standards in terms of governance and financial management, and we ought to be um, held accountable to the higher standards as national treasury in terms of governance and uh, financial management. And yes, Chair, we might have come across in handling this matter as not holding ourselves to um, higher standards, highest actually, not even higher, but higher standards. Uh, we might have come across as not um, meeting the standards that are required uh, of us. And thanks very much for um, reminding us and um, on, 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 on the necessity for us to be um, held at the highest standard and hold ourselves as National Treasury to the higher standards of governance and financial management. Indeed, we should be the pinnacle of uh, the best and the highest standards uh, in the country and uh, in the world uh, as well. Um, and, and I think um, we will, um, because you're right, if we don't, it will have a demonstrating effect. Other entities, other um, departments will use it, you'll use us as a measure according to which they conduct uh, themselves. Uh, there's a saying that says, monkey see, monkey do. And, and will not want to set the bad example. And if we came across in, in our attempt to explain uh, the way in which we are dealing with this matter, um, uh, we came across as not holding ourselves to the high standards. We really want to um, uh, apologize. And we've had the feedback. We are uh, listening, not arrogant, uh, department, uh, we are uh, a listening uh, department, and uh, we take um, criticism kindly. And of course, when we respond to uh, those criticisms, we are not always right. Uh, but as we do so, we don't want to project ourselves as as, as arrogant. So, chair, uh, we've heard the timelines. And uh, we think that these are reasonable timelines within which we have to come back uh, to the committee, um, basically to account to South Africans through you, because it's through these committees that we, as government, were held to account, and you are the tribune, you are the representatives of the people. People speak through you. So we take seriously what you've said, and within uh, those timelines that you've given us, we'll definitely come back to you. And thank very much for this opportunity. All right, thank you very much. Thank you much to the DMs, DGs, the executives, Babum TV, and the SIU uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the meeting stands adjourned, and safe traveling messages to everybody, particularly during this season. Uh, of the Easter weekend. Take care. God bless. Meeting agenda.